Hey, good morning everyone. Welcome back. Uh, another fun video here at Blue Glow Electronics. Today on the bench we've got another Marantz uh, 2270. These are great little units um, if you can find one of them. This one, a uh, local guy happened to find it at a uh, flea market and picked it up. Um, but he said, you know, it just wasn't working. Um, and I think he knew that when he, when he bought it. But, um, you know, we've got it powered up and it takes a little time for the speaker relay protection relay to kick in so I know something's not right with it but um let's see what I let's dive in and see what we've got here so the first thing I've got going is I'm running a uh, one kilohertz uh, you know, 1.034 but uh, basically a one kilohertz tone through uh, through this thing coming out of the uh, BK precision here uh, function generator and it's just a plain old sine wave and I'm feeding that on the input here through uh, the cable into the aux port and I've got it running at about half volume right now um, and check out our nice little sine wave that we have coming out of this thing on um, it's pretty darn ugly if you ask me <laughs> watch as I turn the volume it uh, it just kinda really really ugly so um, Interestingly, that's on the uh, the right channel. When I hit the left channel, there's a little bit of nothing there. And if I take the volt um, selector way down or way up, I notice I basically got the same waveform, but it is really, really small, um, extremely teeny. So let's put a little thought into what we've got going on here right now. Um, first off, this indicates to me that we've got a power supply problem of some sort because um, we're, we're not balanced uh, taking huge dips here on the upswing and um, so I'm definitely going to tear into the power supply board here but when I've swept to the other channel and I'm, I'm way way down I mean this is in the um, 7 millivolt range um, it's telling me I probably got some other problems on the output of this side over here so Let's maybe dive in and take a look at the outputs and see what's going on. Okay, as you can see here, we've got the uh, the two power transistors here mounted to the heat sink. Um, and this is the left channel. You'll have the exact same thing on the right channel on the other side. And I've gone ahead and removed the two stainless steel screws that were in this uh, top thing here just for simplicity of the video. But they're just as simple as putting a Phillips head screwdriver and removing them. I will give you a little word of caution here. If you're going to um, remove one of these, do not remove them both. Or if you're going to remove them both, um, get you a Sharpie and mark top and bottom on these. Um, one is an NPN transistor here and the other is a PNP transistor. They have different numbers. Um, if you happen to pull them both out and then you don't remember which way they go back in, um, you stand a risk of uh, having a positive supply of voltage on this one and a negative on this one. If you get that back backwards and uh, put them in there, you're likely to blow both transistors at the same time. So uh, would not leave you in a good state. But once you've got the uh, two screws removed, it's really as simple as getting a good firm grasp on the uh, transistor, either on the outer part here like I'm doing right now, or um, on one of the ends and pull the whole thing straight out. It's got a socket there that's designed um, basically to be pulled out like I just did. And a lot of times the little uh, mica um, piece here will come with it, which is designed to help um, transfer heat um, and but play an insulator role. But um, now you can see this is here. And on the other side, I don't know if we can get down in here and see, but there's a, uh, a little plastic socket down in here and this thing moves, it'll move in and out of the little holes um, that come through right here. So basically, I don't know, let me see if I can move this back and show you here. Give me one second. Um, yeah, you can kind of see the socket down in here now and how it's just a little plastic things that um, when you get them right, they pop up in there and go inside the holes like that. And so um, then you can kind of see the plastic from the other side here. And the screw goes through that. And what happens is it keeps the screw from touching the metal here. And then ultimately touching the heat sink and uh, shorting things out. So 
Boy, I'm struggling to keep this camera in focus. I got to figure out some new settings on it, but at any rate, um, I pulled this one out and let's uh, let's hook a meter up to it and see what we come up with here real quick. I've got the little um, Atlas uh, DCA, model DCA 55. This, I love this thing because all you have to do is hook the um, hook wires up and you don't have to go to a manual and look up and see what is emitter, what is base, what is collector. All you have to do is hook this thing up to the three leads um, on a uh, TO220 like this. Um, can the um, you don't have, the outer can part is one of the leads. And let's see here what we've got. Oh, it read that one quickly. Let me do it again here just so you can see it. Short circuit on red blue. So the emitter to collector connect, um, connection here. This thing's actually labeled emitter, but uh, to collector is shorted and that's what's causing our problem over here on the right hand output so what what's happening is it's still playing on the right hand side but all you're getting in there is a little bit of the driver transistor and depending on how these things short when they go out uh, they're likely to uh, either take out or strain the driver transistor so a lot of times i i replace those as well i highly recommend unless you happen to um get lucky enough to find the original Motorola part number here which have been um, obsolete for a long time that what you do instead is actually um, replace both of these at one time and not um, not just one of them so well, what I'm going to do for here is order a pair um, both the uh, PNP and the NPN and um, we'll put these in I'll tell you I'll tell you which kind I'll replace it with Okay, there's a great little thread out here on um, on the Marantz, um I mean on the Audio Karma forms, and um, you kind of scroll down in it here. A uh, guy named Echo Wars made a post here, a really good one, and it's kind of telling you the classic TO3. I said T220 earlier; those are the small ones. The TO3 are the big ones. Um, they're going away basically, and there's only a couple reliable substitutes out there. They're all made by Own Semi. And um, this is the list of them. So you got to get them in pairs. So it's like MJ21193 here um, and 21194. And so um, as you read on down, people are saying this top set is the best one to get. And you know, if you kind of Google this, uh, you know, search for Google here. Um, and if you pull these things up, you see people like Mauser or whatnot sell them. So. Uh, they're not too hard to get, um, but um, we've got a set on order at this point, to be honest, and they should be here one day this week, and we will uh, we'll get these things put in. All right, for kicks and giggles, I thought I would pull the other one. If you'll notice, I marked this, marked this one with a T on it for top and the other one B for bottom, and I've got it plugged in right here, and let's go ahead and uh, turn it on. And lo and behold, good, we got a PMP transistor. Uh, it tells me the layout, tells me the current gain, tells me the test current that it used, uh, the base emitter voltage, which is about right, and the test current. Um, so, leakage current, none. Hey, good. So, we've got at least one of these is good. Unfortunately, it does me no good. <laughs> I can at least put it in the stash for maybe somebody else one day that has one burnout that happens to be the other one. But you could not match this with, um, you would not want to match it with a, uh, you know, by buying just one of the new two um, that I just showed you. Um, you want to get, you want to get matched pairs from the same manufacturer and put those in together. Um, otherwise you could be, could be asking for a short life on some uh, transistors or, and or struggle with uh, getting it balanced proportionally, biased proportionally. Okay, if you'll notice on this one I wrote um, good and uh, on this one I put the big black X and put bad. And I'm going to bag these up um, here along with the screws and the mica so that they don't get lost while I'm waiting on the uh, the other parts here. Okay, I sent the owner of the amplifier a quote um, to get this amplifier up to specs. And uh, let me tell you what I'll uh, include in the quote. First off, um, I want to rebuild the... Um, driver board here, uh, the uh, preamp board. I want to rebuild the phono board here. The um, 
probably will not show those two being done in this video because I have made videos specifically on restoring both of these over time and you can just go out there and find those on YouTube and watch them. I'm going to check out the big capacitors here in the power supply. Um, going to rebuild both the, the uh, output driver boards here um, on the output stages and let me flip this over. And we're going to rebuild the power supply here and replace all the caps in it. Check out the uh, relay. And I probably won't show that in the video either because you've uh, you've seen that before. I've made a video specifically on rebuilding power supplies in Marantz units. And then ultimately we'll end up um, you know rebiasing the unit once we get the new transistors in it. And we'll end up on just you know kind of checking the front end here, the tuner and the FM alignment. But the, um, the other thing that the customer was very interested in was getting all the bulbs on the front end replaced with um, white LEDs. So I'm going to go ahead and get busy today. I'm going to pull the faceplate here, get the, the uh, dial glass out, and um, you know get the LEDs replaced in there, kind of get everything cleaned up. Um, I'll deox all the pots on it, and then we're going to go ahead... Um, and rebuild these boards here, 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 and underneath. So that's a good, uh, just so people have an estimate in their head, that's a good three hours worth of work. Uh, it's not something you're going to sit down and do in 15 minutes, not if you do it properly. And, um, you know, then we'll, have, we'll still have work beyond that. But, you know, good restoration on one of these things. You'll have a good five or six hours into it. So it's not a trivial task. Hold tight and we'll show you some of it as we go along. Okay, I've been pulling knobs off the front. I've got the four screws out here. Uh, pull this knob, this knob, and now it's going to require me to do the old uh, spoon trick where you put a spoon on each side of the knob. Um, so I'll have one there and one on the other side. I'll end up sliding it to the edge of the table here um, as such so that I can get a spoon under each side. But it takes two hands and I'm holding the camera. so. Uh, but you get the idea. You put one here and like this, and you put one here and you use both hands and you kind of gently push. And the, the rocking action here, the back of the spoon, will um, will pull this thing right off and it'll put no dents or scratches on your faceplate. If you uh, if you get in here with a screwdriver and start digging, almost inevitably you'll always end up with scratches. And as you can see, that took about literally one minute to get those things off. Um, was really really easy. Not much to it. I'll have to glue this little plastic back into the to the face. Um, anyway, we're gonna get this plastic dial off now and uh, I usually remove these two screws right here. That This is nothing more than an end cap to let the light, to keep the light from stopping here or light seeking, seeping in. But it makes it easier if you get that off. And then these two little screws right here. And then you'll just kind of start working on one end with a little screwdriver or something behind it, maybe a guitar pick or something. I actually use some of the iPhone uh, tools that I've got around here for removing screens on iPhones and whatnot to get in here and pop behind that. And you just work your way around and uh, the glue will come loose um, and typically the vellum will tear and come out as well. But we're going to replace both of those. Just another tip. I was doing it uh, myself so I thought I'd make it show it in the video. But you know, when you go to remove screws, like I, I just took these two out up here, it's easy for them to drop out. And uh, I've got this little wire uh, magnetizer where you basically put this thing in here, run your screwdriver around a few dozen times, and uh, and it's magnetized. And I often do the same here on my, my little drill driver. I'll kind of run, uh, I can't do it one-handed, but kind of run this around in here. And uh, next thing you know, then you're, uh, let's see here. That magnet's pretty strong, but next thing you know, you can uh, see you're you're picking these things up magnetically. And uh, anytime you unscrew something with the uh, with a magnetic screwdriver, the chances of losing your screws and dropping down inside the unit and uh, causing issues or getting lost is much better. I think these things are about fifteen dollars, uh, something like that. By the way, in one of my last videos, I was um, let me see if I can find it over here. I posted this uh, okay industries um wire wrap tool and i told on the video i said you can get one for like 12 or 15 dollars boy was i wrong um i must have picked this up at a ham fest or a flea market or something at a steel 
um, because these things are more like 40 to $60, uh, 40 if you're lucky. Most of them are in the 55 to $60 range. So apologize for giving you some uh, wrong price info, but I, I thought this would be a neat little tip to show you today. These things are really handy and you can also do magnetize, but I've never actually used that. Um, but I do magnetize a lot of screwdriver tips. Okay, we've got the faceplate off now and um, it was kind of a tricky little uh, deal to do. And it was also, uh, I found something interesting on it. So basically I just started here at one corner and got a teeniest little screwdriver. Um, that thing is really, really small. And I just got it back here in behind the corner and started working it a little bit. Sometimes I'll use one of these tools like this that is um, you know, made for iPhones or um, iPads and you kind of get it up in here and work it a little bit along. But it started coming loose really, really easy on this end. And then I got down towards this end and I noticed that there was a crack in the dial, just a slight hairline crack. So I had to be real careful working down on this end. Um, what I did was I kind of worked down towards the crack and then I came on the other side and started working this way away from the crack. But let me show you what I found. It's really interesting. Um, I'm not sure if the, the guy that owns this or maybe a previous owner had uh, been trying to clean all the pots and dials in this thing, but whatever they had done, they had sprayed enough that it had leaked down in here and got all in behind the dial. And you can kind of see here, uh, let, me get the, let me get it turned around this way. You kind of see here where the chemical has really started etching into the black plastic a little bit. And uh, this is never going to come out. It's got the black plastic bubble just a little bit here on the back side. Um, and you can kind of see the square frame here of uh, what would be kind of a two-sided glue adhesive tape um, that goes around and holds the vellum and then the same thing done on this end um, kind of holds it into the frame here. But this thing had been sprayed so much that uh, this, the vellum just fell off. Um, you can see here. If you'll notice the vellum is still soaking wet. Um, so I've had this thing um, it's been sitting for two or two or three months waiting to get into the queue, uh, but yet it's still that wet. So I'm not sure what the chemical was, but like I said, it started to etch into a little bit of the uh, dial. And you can still see here the dial is just soaking wet from it. But sure did making sure did make removing the vellum easy. Usually, usually you have to take a uh, you know a razor knife or a flat blade and work really hard along this to get this vellum off, and it inevitably almost always tears. But but we're going to replace this anyway. This is kind of the old brown yucky stuff, and uh, we'll get the new glued down on here, and we'll get this uh, dial back in. I'll show you the crack. It's it's really tough to see um, here on this thing. You gotta get just the right light here. Right there it is, you can see. Let me get it turned around here. Um, you might be able to see it right here. Yeah, just the slightest little hairline crack right there. But I don't think you'll end up seeing that at all, honestly, because um, it goes in behind this dial on the faceplate, this glass, and this is a smoked, uh, smoked glass on this thing, so. I don't think you'll you'll ever be able to see it, and that's uh, I know that the uh, owner didn't point it out to me, and they they probably never saw it. But it is just a super small hairline crack there. I don't know whether someone had tried to remove the dial before, or no, I don't think this chemical would have caused it. But you can see here on this end as it goes down through there, all the etching and pitting that the the chemical started causing on the. Uh, on the dial. I kind of hate that. I would I would try to find a uh, replacement dial for the, the individual. I'll look and see what I have and I'll look out there on eBay as well. Okay, up next it's just a matter of us make sure this thing's powered off. And it's just a matter of getting a screwdriver in here behind each of these bulbs and kind of working them out. Um, one at a time here. And typically stuff like this I'll uh, end up you know, you can see them over here. I'll end up putting those things into a Ziploc bag and giving them back to the customer so that they have all their original parts. But um, as you can see here, we've got five bulbs to replace here. I'm going to check and make sure all these bulbs are good. And if you'll remember from one of my previous Hamfest videos, I found a bag of about probably 500 or maybe more um, of these type bulbs right here. So I'm in good stock on this for a while to come. And we got them at a good deal, so I'd, you know, I'd pass that good price on to the customer and uh, 
not charge them an arm and a leg if I do have to replace any of those. We're also going to have to uh, get this, these, there's a screw, let me show you. There's a screw right here on the back side and there's also another screw right here on the back side. Once you get these two loose, then this whole panel kind of comes out and there's two more lights. Um, I'll call these the little um, uh, fuse style lights. There's two more in here behind these things and we're going to replace both of those as well. I'll give you a good example. This right here is a great example. I just unscrewed this thing of where having a magnetic screwdriver, see that screw comes up with you? Um, if you don't have your tips magnetized, that screw is going to stay down in there. It's a really tough, tight space to get to, and you're going to be working down in there with, you know, some needle nose pliers or something, trying to get that screw out. It's like a, likely to drop down on this board, and uh, just can't can't tell you how much uh, of a tip magnetizing your screwdrivers are when you're doing this kind of work. Okay, you can see now I've gotten those two screws out. These things come back. And you kind of got to move wires out of the way a little bit to get them back. But that's about all you're going to get out of it. You're going to have to get down in here and pop these things out on each side and pop new ones in. You don't have a lot of room to work with. You'll end up having to use your fingertips or whatnot. And then you just kind of slide that back forward into place. All right. As you can see, we've got all new bulbs in it now at this point. Um, the two behind the... Uh, Signal strength and FM tuning look great, as well as you can see the six uh, new LEDs here. The other thing I was doing was just checking uh, as I walk across, um, you can see each of the bulbs here in the top um, are intact. So no need to replace any of those and the stereo indicator lights there as well. So good deal. Uh, nice and lit up. I am struggling a little bit with this dial. <laughs> um, Faceplate. Let me tell you why. There was so much of the whatever chemical, I don't know if it's deoxid or what, soaked into the old vellum and as well as the uh, glue that was around the vellum on that thing that it's making it hard to glue down the new vellum. Um, it's just not sticking to it. So I'm having to, having to slowly, gently scrape off all the old tape and all the old glue, uh, dry that thing out, and then uh, kind of put it back, um, glue the new vellum back down. It's... Uh, I bet I've got an hour in that dial plate, and I had planned on spending about uh, maybe three or four minutes on it total. But that's how it goes sometimes. Okay, I thought I'd show you real quick why we replaced the vellum on these things. This is the old brown vellum, kind of yellowed. Uh, and as you turn it on, you can see here it just kind of glows yellow. And as you change across the dial here, you, know, you can barely even see the lights in behind. Um, on this thing. It's just really, really, really dim. Hang on, I'll swap it out for the new vellum. Okay, completely swapped out now, and let's see what we've got here. Oh yeah, much brighter. Um, white, not yellow. <laughs> I think it looks much, much better here. Might be hard to kind of tell in this camera, but um, it certainly looks much, much better in person. Okay, we've got the new transistors in, as you can see. Um, the original ones, the SJ2517, was an NPN. It was the one on the top. And the SJ2518 was a PNP, which was on the bottom. Um, but if you'll notice here, the uh, the numbers kind of flip around a little bit. The, the MJ21193 is actually the PMP, and the MJ21194 is the NPN. And so I just kind of correlated there and said bottom and top. And you can see the four new ones that I've that I've gotten in here. We're going to get those uh, greased up with a little bit of uh, oh, heat sink compound and on the micas and get them put back in here and get them mounted up properly. I know the light's not very good here, but I find it easiest to put the unit up on its side like this. You can see. Um, that way you can kind of get down where these two holes are at right here. Um, and you can reach underneath, as you can see here, I'm doing with a chopstick, and kind of pull the grommet up into the holes. And that way when you push the... And I go ahead and put the uh, mica on the transistor and soak it down good. That way when you push this in there, um, you can kind of hold it up with the other end here, something underneath of it. 
make sure the transistor gets really sock, um, seated well into the socket and then it's really easy to just drop the two screws in from the top and screw them down while you continue to hold it here from the under uh, underside. You can see here um, up under there how the little um, sockets can just drop out and you got to hold them up into those holes. So hopefully this will help you understand how to put them in it. Okay, I thought I'd show you a little tip here, a uh, troubleshooting tip. So if you notice I've got both these jacks plugged into the auxiliary point at this port at this point in time. Let's flip it around and I'll show you my trick. Okay, I've got the new transistors installed in this thing. As you can see over here on the side. And we plugged it up and not such great results. So, uh, you know, I always scratch my head a little bit. But then I always go back to the basic troubleshooting principle. So let me show you what we've got going on. Got this thing kind of uh, all the way on the left channel right now. Um, thought I'd show you what this thing looks like up here on the oscilloscope. It's not a great sine wave. It's supposed to be a one kilohertz sine wave. Does not look good at all. And um, when I flip to the other side, ouch! You can see I got some really, really ugly. Uh, signals here on the other channel as well. So, um, you know, you're starting to say, wow, I've got ugliness on both channels. I've replaced the driver, I mean, the uh, output transistors on one side and uh, still not great. So, what are we going to do? Let's show you. Um, first thing we're going to do is kind of kill the variac down here. Power switch. And I'm going to spin this thing around like such. These things always have, um, ranch units, have a pre-out and a pre-in. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to pull these two plugs right here. Um, one's the right channel and one's the left channel. These things are usually <clears throat> on there really, really good. And then I'm going to take this part and I'm going to run it just into the main end. So keep in mind, what this, what this does is it breaks a connection between the pre-amp board in this unit and the output driver um, power output on boards and so basically you have the option here of, let's say you had a different preamp you could run cables right into this um, from a different preamp and then use the amplifier section of this unit or if you wanted to let's say you had a different amplifier like a tube amplifier but you still wanted a um, an AM FM and phono front end you could come out of this unit and feed in maybe into the tube amplifier and only use the front end of this amplifier. But if you got these plugs in here, you bridge the gap between them and you're using the front end and the outputs of this amplifier. But I'm going to flip this over to just the main end at this point. And we're going to spin it back around here. And let's power this thing back on. Whoops, let me uh, hit the very act. And give it one second here for the relays to kick in. They're taking a little longer than need to be to kick in and it, uh, I want to rebuild the power supply, but let me turn this down. Um, take a look at that. Beautiful little sine wave on the right channel, left channel. Beautiful sine wave. So the outputs of this thing, listen as I turn the volume up. And you can see here, this thing stay pretty darn linear and the volume gets loud. So both outputs of this thing are working great. Um, if you'll notice at this point with me feeding to the main outputs, the volume knob here does absolutely nothing. I'm having to control the volume up here with this amplitude knob on the, uh, as you can see, on the function generator itself. So I'm going to kill this thing over here and put it on dummy load. But as you can see, what we just proved is that the output sections of this amp are in great shape. You know, I've still got to rebias them, still going to rebuild them, replace the caps on them, but they're functional at this point. The problems, all that ugliness lies in the preamp section of this thing. And so we're going to totally rebuild that preamp board. And I think I've talked to you in other videos about the fact that the preamp boards on these Moranch units have some old transistors that are notorious for causing problems. So we're going to replace those as well. Hope that little tip uh, teaches you something. You could have done just the opposite. Let's say um, 
you know, if, uh, if the problem has still existed on the output, I could have then ran the pre-out jacks on this thing into another amplifier, and I'd have been able to determine if the front end on it was sounding good or not. I just ran across something very interesting. I've been just going through, um, you know, kind of replacing caps in the power supply here, as you can see with uh, new Nikki Con caps. And I'm about halfway through the power supply at this point, but I was replacing these big 330 microfarad 50 volt capacitors that um, that seem to be ones that you know don't hold up all that well over time. I always replace them. And I usually use some uh, brand new Nikki Con uh, 63 volts, uh, 105 degrees, so these things will last a long time. But here's where it got really interesting. Um, if you'll notice when I pulled this one out, I had two nice leads that came out, one side and the other, and uh, where I'd unsoldered them for the other side of the board. When I pulled this one out, if you'll notice, I had one lead, and if you'll notice, the other lead is bent completely over and kind of crammed into the plastic right here. So what I realized is this was a factory error. This capacitor has never been in the amp since the day this uh, unit was built. You can see how it got curled over. And when I, when I had this cap out right here, I've already soldered the new one in. But you could see underneath of it where the thing had kind of crammed into the board. And instead of going through the board, it had curled up like that. And, uh, you know, as you can see right here, it's kind of all curled up there on the end. Um, I thought it was just very, very interesting. And uh, I've ran across some factory errors before. You know, things like markings on circuit boards where they would say plus and minus for capacitors. The markings being wrong. But I don't think I've ever ran into a capacitor that was uh, installed but never completely installed and functional in a Marantz unit. So... Anyway, I thought I'd share. Sometimes you, your reason your radio may not be working is it was designed from the factory not to work. And uh, I just wonder how, what, what kind of challenges that's created over time. Okay, I've drawn a little block diagram here. Hopefully to help you better understand kind of the uh, how this amplifier works. This, this holds true for just about any Marantz unit. Any Sensui unit and uh, most, most every... Um, stereo receiver out there. Not all of them will have these jumpers here. If you remember earlier, these two little jumpers right here that I took out to demonstrate um, whether the amp was having a problem in the preamp or in the outputs. Um, that's what these two jumpers right here represent. But basically you have the inputs, right? All these different switches um, right here. You've got aux and uh, phono, etc that would be the inputs to the amplifier. Then it goes through a volume and tone switches. So, um, you know, kind of your balance, volume, tone, etc. And um, as well as your band selector. So there's where you would switch between FM, maybe phono, or if you plug something into maybe the aux port up here. It would simply feed down through here into this um, and straight across into the preamp. Whereas if you plug something into the phono, it would go up through another stage here in the phono. And if you put it on FM, you really wouldn't be coming through here. It really doesn't feed through here. Um, well, actually, it would feed through here, but wouldn't feed through the inputs here on this side. Um, it would actually get the FM part um, from an antenna here, so two of these. So you would kind of pick up from the antenna. Anyway, we've... Um, kind of proven thus far because we disconnected these two jumpers and we fed in right here with our little um, iPod and when we did that audio went straight through these amplifiers here and played just fine um, to the outputs here. So we know this part of the amplifier kind of you know from here from here over at this point We've got a big check mark. We're in good shape. And I've actually rebuilt both of these um, outputs at this point. Um, at this point, you can see the power supply kind of connects. I drew these little dotted lines. kind of connects all around to all of these things. And we can put a big check mark on the power supply because I've completely rebuilt it and I've checked the voltages coming out of it at this point in time. 
So, what, what are we left with at this point in time? Well, we know working through the aux, straight in through here into the preamp, in other words, bypassing the FM and the phono, that we have the issue. So guess what? We've narrowed our issue down to right here because we know when you get on the other side of it, the issue goes away. Um, and when you're feeding from the inputs through the volume tone, etc., and you're plugged in on aux, you're going directly to the preamp. So this, bad right now. We're going to dive in next and rebuild that board. Okay, here on the back of the Marantz unit, um, up in here are these tone controls and kind of the band switches that choose between aux and whatnot. On the top of this board is where the uh, tone controls, as well as you get up here and you get to the volume control and balance, etc. Um, kind of feeds in through here. Um, this is the phono stage that um, has not been in play thus far. We've not ran through the phono stage. And this board up here happens to be the power supply board, and we've completely rebuilt it at this point in time. And we've rebuilt this output on the left channel and this output on the right channel. So this is the uh, culprit we're chasing down next. Mounts right here in the middle with four screws, which I've already disconnected so you can get room to solder on both sides of it. And if you'll notice here on this thing, there's a multitude of capacitors. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven capacitors on this thing we're going to replace. And there's a couple um, output transistors that are um, known for causing some issues, so we're going to replace those as well. But let's get that done and see how it uh, how it shapes up. If that's the case, then really all I've got left to do, uh, ho hopefully, luckily, is we'll have to uh, you know rebuild the phono board down here, make sure it's in good shape for the customer, as well as check out our FM specs and whatnot, and we'll we would have this thing done. So. Fingers crossed, let's uh, let's see what we can do with this board here. Okay, first thing I've done before I've ever even started with the soldering iron is I've gone through, and if you notice, I put a little black mark right here. It's just a reference indicator point, and then I've marked the capacitors, every one of them. You can see here, here, here. I've gone through every one of them and put a tick mark on the capacitors facing this direction. That way, when you pull one out, um, you know, just in case the markings on the board are bad or whatnot, it's easy for you to then hold the capacitor up and kind of say, hey, this thing was, uh, the black line was facing this way, so I know which way to put the new one in. What we're going to do is just work our way through this board and replace all these capacitors. I've got uh, similar ones in bins that we'll pull out and replace them with. Uh, I'll use the same capacitance value and uh, either equal or larger voltage values throughout. Okay, I thought I'd show you something I found on these boards, and it's not uncommon. But you can see it right here. You can see that the negative side of this little point on one microfarad capacitor goes here, but the positive side does not go in the hole. See the little hole and the way the diagram's drawn here with the positive sign and then the hole? It doesn't go there. It actually tags down here to the next capacitor. They go into the same hole um, the negative of this capacitor, and then the positive comes out down here below it and goes into this hole. So it's where the board is not um, designed exactly right, and um, somewhere in the manufacturing path they did this, because this is original the way it came from the factory. As you can see up here, I've, um, I've already replaced the ones above it, and I've uh, kind of jumpered out with a 3.3 and a 1.0 microfarad, both uh, high-end Nikecon capacitors. but. Got that one done, and now I'm starting to work on uh, these. But it's just something where I, th I thought I'd show you where the board is not always correct. Okay, I thought I'd show you right here. You can see this is the way these things come out. You've got the 3.3 kind of connected in series, uh, twisted together here, uh, then with the 1 microfarad. And we had the same thing on the other side when I took it out, the 3.3 and the 1 kind of gang together. You can also see here, I used my iPhone, took a nice picture because... Yeah, it can get a little complicated sometimes taking stuff in and out completely like that. And you always want a good picture as you're working to know exactly how to put that stuff back together. And here are the caps I'm putting back in there. 3.3 microfarad on uh, Nikki Khan's 105 uh, or 50 volt 85 degrees. And these are 100, one, one microfarad 50 volt 105 degree Nikki Khan's or Nikki Khan's. Um, always great capacitors to use. Get them from uh, Mal's or DigiKey, any of those sources. Okay, as you can see, we've got the board recapped. 
You remember my little tip as I get each uh, cap done here, I always color the tip of it in red, not to be confused with the black marks I put on to begin with to, uh, to help me orientate. But we've replaced all the caps and I just kind of put one screw back in here to hold this board in. And then what did we do? Um, we powered it up. We put a one kilohertz, uh, a little more than one kilohertz. Uh, let's slow it down here. That's uh, about a kilohertz there. Um, and check it out. Listen. Beautiful. Other side. Beautiful. I'm flipping between the outputs here and there is no difference whatsoever between the left channel. You see a little bit of a glitch when I flip it and the right channel. Um, equal, equal sine wave coming out. Um, so this whole apps problem we just solved right here in this board. And it aligns up well with our diagnostics we had done just using just using this simple little uh, kind of block diagram I had drawn with inputs kind of the selectors phono FM preamp because remember we plugged into here and here um, with these jacks and went in here and playing out through here everything sounded great playing out through here everything sounded great um, and then when we fed straight in through aux bypassing phono and FM we had problems so we knew it was in here didn't know if it was the transistors didn't know if it was capacitors we replaced all the caps in it by the way none of them looked bad visually you would have never found this um, I only found this by replacing every single capacitor on this board um, troubleshot the problem and lo and behold hang on I'll hook some music up and let you hear it Volume knob. Alright. You get the idea. It's sounding great. Um, still got some more work ahead of us. I still want to rebuild this phono board right here. Um, before I send it back because I, I promised the customer I was going to do a, a full restoration of this unit so I want to I want to rebuild the phono board as well as um, check the FM alignment on this thing make sure it's good going to bias the outputs all of these things you can find in other videos I've made hopefully um, but we'll walk you through high level steps as we go okay we started work on the piece um, 700 phono board already replaced this capacitor but I was going to jump on and replace these um, these tantalums right here as well as we'll end up um, replacing these little diodes and whatnot in it but I wanted to show you something just to make you aware definitely these transistors right here have to go those are the worst worst units ever made um, do not hold up well and they uh, certainly cause issues but if you go out on YouTube and just uh, type in P700 phono board you will see an entire video I made on just how to rebuild this board from head to toe. And um, these were some of the notes I had used during uh, the replacement of that. But um, I did notice one error here. I've wrote down 0.22 microfarads. It should just be um, 22 microfarad capacitors, not 0.22. And um, other than that, everything about that video is spot on. I'm going to go in and do a correction on that video, I think. But... And make sure you replace H706 and 705 with some uh, KSC 1845s. And those are those two transistors right here that I'm talking about. But I'm not going to walk you through the details of this because i got a full video out there on it. Okay, we've got the uh, FM, I mean the phono board done at this point. We've also done the FM alignment on this thing. And I've had a lot of people ask me, hey, why don't you show us the FM alignment procedure as well? It's not all that simple. Um, I probably need to make a video just on that topic, and, I, and I'll show you why. Um, I use a Sound, Sound Technology 1000A FM alignment generator, and the, the steps are not all that bad. You basically walk down this chart right here. Um, you kind of do the IF alignment, um, then the RF adjustment, and you align the detector. 
and then you kind of uh, make sure that the bandwidth and all that's set properly. And um, it's a little bit of a complicated setup. You come out of the uh, 1000A basically into the 300 ohm um, unit if you've got a 50 ohm to 300 ohm Balin basically. And if you don't, that's what that Model 100 was. If you don't have that, then you basically have to come out of this with 50 ohms into the 75 ohm lead. Here you just lose a, the, the, uh, at that point the markings on this thing are not 100% accurate as far as signal level because uh, you lose a little bit in the translation. And then you kind of drive the external drive on your oscilloscope and then the uh, the internal or the horizontal and the vertical then um, you use it as test points throughout the receiver. And I match that back up with the uh, service manual. And you basically do these alignment procedures here on the right hand side. It's uh, it, it's it's pretty involved to be honest. Um, <laughs> And not something I would want to do on every one of these uh, receiver restorations. So what I'll do is I'll set that up sometime soon uh, when I find the time. And I'll do a video just on FM alignment. But I do have a lot of people ask me about that. Hey, did you align the FM on my receiver? Yes, absolutely I did. Um, then I get a question about why didn't you show that in the video. And I'll say, well, <laughs> it's not something that most people could do. And two, uh, it's pretty advanced relative to everything else we've been doing. But two, you gotta you gotta have an FM sweep generator, and uh, this is a really good one. There's a couple others out on the market, but to be honest, these things these these run in the neighborhood of uh, 750 to a thousand dollars for a nice one that's been uh, calibrated, and uh, you know even some of the lower end ones will be five or six hundred. So it's it, it's not something your average uh, person just has laying around on their bench, kind of like yeah, you know, most everything else we've been doing. You know we've been doing with. Um, Multimeters, maybe a two hundred dollar oscilloscope, etc. But um, we'll try to get around to making a video just on that topic. All right, I don't get enough of a signal down here without the generator hooked up to actually uh, to actually drive the stereo. Um, needle but hang on a second we'll see if we can do that yay got one station strong enough down here in the basement all right the fm's aligned well at this point and uh sounding good let's see what else we got left to do All right, we've just been listening to it for the last hour or so, making sure everything checked out well. Um, just thought I'd walk you through everything I did to it. Um, replaced the output transistors, a uh, new set on this thing. Uh, recapped both the left and the right output boards here. Uh, we recapped the entire power supply on this thing. You saw we rebuilt and recapped the preamp board underneath. We rebuilt and recapped the phono board as well as replacing the transistors on it. We biased the outputs on these things, and I did not show some of these steps because I've shown them in other videos. Um, I've got a video just on biasing output uh, boards, and uh, it's the same same process. You basically adjust one of these knobs to uh, to DC offset of zero, where you have no out, um, DC voltage sitting on your outputs, and then you adjust the other one for a set amount of idle current across the resistor in this thing. And the service manual will tell you how to manage, um, how to read that, or watch one of my other videos. I think I've made several on the 2270 thus far. I um, went through and cleaned and lubricated the whole tuner and dial path here, so this thing uh, moves easily. You can see the grease here on the board. Um, we deoxided all the pots and switches, um, cleaned that mess up from before. Um, we did a bench test and uh, checked the TS THD frequency response and uh, harmonic distortion. All that was nice and clean. 
as well as we put new white LEDs across the front and replaced the vellum paper. And we did some repair damage on the back of this um, dial that had, um, I don't know if you remember, but it had some, uh, the deoxid on the inside had ate through and started pitting the back of the dial and I was wearing it thin, so uh, yeah, fixed that. I will tell you, when these Marantz units are right, they're amazing units, and uh, just just for a general sense, uh, typical repair like this, recap, um, you know, replace some transistors, dial or whatnot, this whole unit turned out to be $330 was the cost on this thing, so if that gives you uh, out in YouTube land a little relevance to what one of these units cost, but you gotta look at, um, that preamp board took me an hour, a good solid hour. Phono board was a good solid 45 minutes. I had a good hour and a half in rebuilding both of these boards and biasing them. Um, had another hour right at it in rebuilding the power supply here. Um, so you, you know you start looking at it and, and wow you got eight eight or ten hours in one of these things when you get done. You start doing the math on that and it doesn't take a lot to get you up in the uh, couple hundred dollar range and uh, I really hate to charge that much, but um, I'm still charging less than your average auto mechanic out there, and there's a gazillion of those, and uh, you know how hard it is to find somebody to work on electronics equipment. So, uh, <laughs> But even with that, I think I'm still charging about half what some of the bigger shops do. I have, I have no overhead. All my operations happen here in the basement. But Hopefully this was an insightful video. Going to get the case and the bottom back on this thing. Already shot the invoice here. Um, let me cover up the customer's name here, but this is a typical invoice, you know, where I, uh, company name, my name, um, you know, what I'm working on, description of what's being done, and kind of totals or whatnot. Um, already sent that to the customer in a PDF format and told them where and when they could pick their unit up. So hopefully everybody enjoyed the video, and uh, stay tuned. We'll keep making them. One more out of the queue. I, my queue is seriously backed up right now between kids graduations, moving kids home from college, I got a new son starting college orientation and visits for that kind of stuff as well as I've been traveling a ton for work it's just got my queue backed up so if you notice out there I pause new work as of right now and uh, we'll pick that back up so keep an eye on my queue page it'll tell you how far I am backed up and uh, whether I'm taking in work or not. Thanks again everybody um, stay tuned and we'll keep making these things.